All right. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for the invitation to give the Lauritsen lecture. Um, if I can get this thing to work, I will restore the image and proceed to try and entertain you with uh, adventures in QCD matter and how we can explore it. Um, I want to talk uh, about, start by introducing QCD matter and how we can study it. And then uh, I'm going to tell you how we've figured out that uh, QCD matter at high temperature is strongly coupled. Now, if you have strongly coupled uh, material, which we do in lots of areas of physics, uh, one of the, a number of the key questions are really what are the properties, how does this stuff work? So we uh, can measure how it transports momentum, how uh, quarks and gluons interact with uh, hot, dense, strongly coupled QCD matter. What we can do to try to understand uh, the path towards thermalization. And um, then I want to uh, move to a big surprise that's fairly recent, namely that when you uh, collide protons or a proton on a nucleus and you make a very small uh, bunch of QCD matter, that stuff also behaves hydrodynamically just like the quark gluon plasma does. And what is that trying to tell us? And I think one of the ways to answer that is going to be looking at the properties of cold, cold dense QCD matter. And I'll uh, tell you a little bit about how we're going to do that with the new uh, future electron ion collider. So to create the hottest matter on Earth, what do you do? You start out with the uh, nuclei of uh, normal atoms. And um, that, those nuclei would sit here on the phase diagram of QCD matter down here at baryon density of one times normal nuclear density and a rather low temperature. And then we heat it to 10 to the 12th Kelvin to get it up here into uh, the very high temperature region, the quark gluon, where the quark gluon plasma exists. And that uh, stuff was last seen in the universe about a microsecond after the Big Bang. Now this is certainly, I don't know if it's the hottest spot in the universe, but when we make these collisions, they're certainly the hottest spots on Earth. And then the question that uh, one wants to ask is, uh, so the nuclei do dissolve into a plasma of quarks and gluons, otherwise known as the quark gluon plasma, and we want to know what are its properties, how it works, and why it works that way. So for those of you who don't think about QCD matter all the time, which is probably most of you in the room, uh, let me tell you a little bit, of, remind you of some features of QCD. It's uh, quantum chromodynamics describes the strong interaction, and the strong interaction is mediated by the exchange of gluons. Now, unlike photons, gluons carry color charge. You know, photons are neutral and don't interact with one another. However, because the gluons carry color, they do interact with one another. And that makes life complicated. Uh, it makes the theory non-abelian. And uh, I usually point out that that's math speak for hard. Um, and the reason that it's hard is because if you want to calculate the interaction between a, a pair of uh, quarks, you have to, of course, calculate the uh, gluon exchange. But because the number of gluons is not conserved, you also have to calculate the exchange of two gluons, three gluons, and so on. You have an infinite series. This uh, infinite series coming from the self-interaction among the gluons means that the potential between quarks, plotted here as a function of the distance between quarks, has a really funny property. It increases with the distance between quarks. That's what confines the quarks into the hadrons that we can see in our detectors. At very small distance, though, the uh, potential plummets down to uh, nearly zero. That's known as asymptotic freedom. And so that would give rise to the expectation that if you made a system dense enough that the uh, average distance between the quarks is very small, then you should lose the confining potential. So what happens at high temperature, high density, is that the uh, many produced particles, which also carry color, their gluons and quarks, they start to screen this confining potential. And the higher the temperature, the more the screening, until you finally get to some critical temperature that's about 160 MeV. And then this confining potential is entirely screened away, and you should have a, a phase transition to a deconfined quark gluon plasma. 
So in order to try and do this in the lab and prove it right and figure out how the plasma works, we need heaters. As uh, Brad mentioned, we use uh, colliders to heat the nuclei. We use the Large Hadron Collider in, at CERN and the uh, Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider at Brookhaven. And we put in the heaviest possible nluclei that we can in order to make the quark gluon plasma over some maximum volume. Obviously, the volume is still pretty small. It's the size of a nucleus, at least to begin with. Um, you have uh, lead on lead at CERN and uh, gold on gold at Brookhaven. And the main reason for the difference is uh, the, the nature of the ion sources at the two places. They're a bit different. But they're both really heavy nuclei. So you collide gold on gold or lead on lead, and you make a lot of particles. You know, five-ish thousand here at uh, at least 5,000 at RIC and even more at the LHC. Those are pictures from TPCs, so uh, it's, actual, it's an actual event display in each case. The, uh, this large number of particles are measured in big detectors. Here you see star, phoenix, Alice, those are the uh, three collider detectors that have been optimized to study quark gluon plasma. And like most big collider detectors, they're big. You can tell how big there's a person crouching in here, and there's a person working over here. So the usual sort of collider detector, except that they're optimized to be able to measure hundreds of particles or even thousands at once. Um, one other interesting fact about these collisions if you follow along this uh, cartoon here, you can see that at uh, TeV level energies, the uh, nuclei are, of course, highly Lorentz contracted. Here is a step where they're just about to penetrate. Here is as they interpenetrate one another and start to make secondary particles. And then those secondaries react among themselves and make a lot more particles until eventually you have a this region where the quark gluon plasma is with the remnant uh, beams long gone down the beam pipe. And eventually, of course, that uh, system expands and cools. You can't put it in a box. And so it cools back down through the phase transition to hadrons, and that's what you measure in your detector. The plasma lives for about 3 times 10 to the minus 23 seconds. And it's only you know, nuclear size, so 10 to the 12 centimeters across. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, how in the world can you make measurements to actually do physics with this stuff? But we can. Um, the way that, of course, you're going to study something that lives this short and is this small is by looking at the particles that come out. And there's lots of them. And there's uh, two kinds of particle probes that you can get at. At uh, relatively low momentum transverse to the beam, so coming out this way, um, you have particles that are radiated from the bulk of the plasma itself. If there are any plasma physicists in the room, that's what uh, you guys will call internal plasma probes. At higher momentum transfers to the beam, then uh, you actually are dealing with what plasma physicists would call an external probe, namely something that is produced and goes through the plasma and then samples it on the way out. I remember one time sitting on an airplane and talking to the person next to me, and they said, oh, I bet you use x-rays. Well, we don't use x-rays for a couple of reasons. One of them is it's the wrong scale. It's at this kind of temperature, you would want hard gamma rays. Uh, the other reason is that, that uh, photons don't participate in the strong interaction. And in fact, they're the perfect control probe. Um, ideally, I would love to have a. Uh, third beam that I could send through the quark gluon plasma, but that's not technically practical. So we use particles that are produced here early in the initial collision and then have to make their way out through the plasma to the detector. So that's a sort of external probe. So how do we know that this quark gluon plasma is strongly coupled? Well, if it's strongly coupled, you should have large collective flows. You should have a significant amount of collectivity in your system that comes from the uh, strong interactions uh, among the many particles. So how would you look for uh, collective uh, interactions like that? Well, you can look for collective flow by looking for a common velocity boost. If you have a, a spherical system, then it's going to uh, 
expand in a, uh, a common way with a common uh, velocity gradient. Our system is a little bit more like a cylinder because the beams are moving at about the speed of light down the beam pipe. And so you can look to see if you have uh, expansions in a cylindrical fashion. And very importantly, you can make the calculation of what this dynamic should look like using hydrodynamics. And then we can compare that to the data. Now, what do we actually measure to try to look for these uh, collective uh, velocity gradients? Well, here you have a uh, sort of cartoon of uh, two gold nuclei which have just interacted. And you can see that the uh, overlap region is not spherically symmetric. It's uh, got sort of an almondy shape. And the particles come out in all directions. If you look at the beam's eye view of this, you can clearly see that the overlap region doesn't get symmetric until you have a perfectly uh, head-on collision or an impact parameter of zero, which, as you know, never exactly happens. Now, this uh, asymmetry here in uh, coordinate space, if you have a pressure gradient, that then gets translated to an anisotropy in momentum space. And that's pretty easy to see because here you've pack the same amount of stuff into a shorter distance so you have a higher pressure in the x direction as compared to the y direction. So what we do is experimentally look for evidence of having a preferred direction in momentum space. The way we do that is you plot the uh, azimuthal angular difference among all pairs of particles that are coming out here in all the directions in azimuth. And if you had no preferred direction, if uh, this asymmetry did not result in any sort of an anisotropy in momentum space, this would be a flat distribution. And you can see from the data shown here that it's certainly not flat. So then uh, we do a Fourier analysis of this uh, opening angle distribution. And the second Fourier component, which we call V2, or elliptic flow, actually measures how well this uh, initial um, asymmetry got turned into a uh, momentum space anisotropy. So if you look at a plot of V2 as a function of the impact parameter where peripheral collisions are here, central collisions are here, you can see in these uh, blue and black data points that you have an anisotropy at the sort of 7 or 8% level, which may sound small, but that's actually pretty huge when you count up all of the particles. Um, the shape is not too surprising because in peripheral collisions, you have a larger initial uh, asymmetry than you do as the collisions get closer and closer to head on. So the fact that the V2, which basically measures the amplitude of this uh, cosine 2 phi, um, that gets bigger when the... Uh, initial asymmetry is bigger. Now, the red lines are the result of a first out-of-the-box, no-tuning uh, calculation with hydrodynamics of how fast should these uh, systems expand. And you can see that except for the most peripheral collisions, the hydrodynamics agrees with the data reasonably well. If I showed you a newer hydrodynamics calculation, you'd see it agrees perfectly well. Yeah. So you can't control it experimentally, but what you do is you look at the number of charged particles produced at the end. And if you go back over here, the larger the overlap region, the more nucleon-nucleon collisions you have, the more charged particles come out. So the only trick is you want to measure the charged particles not in the exact same region of phase space as where you're looking for the correlations. You measure them forward and backward. And that way, it works pretty well to tell what's central and what's peripheral. Of course, you can't measure the impact parameter itself, but you can measure what fraction of the total cross-section gives you a particular uh, uh, multiplicity of particles, and then you can order it that way. Now, you can look at this uh, V2 also as a function of the transverse momentum of the particles. Here it is for pions. Here it is for protons and antiprotons. And the lines, the colored lines, are uh, the predictions from hydrodynamics. And the reason I'm showing you these ancient pictures is these were predictions rather than fits to the data. What you can see is that the blue lines, everybody gets the pions right, 
but the blue lines completely over predict the amount of flow in the uh, protons and antiprotons, whereas the red line comes much closer. And that was one of our very first uh, signals that you had to have the system existing for at least part of its lifetime in the quark gluon plasma phase. If you just assumed it was hadrons all the time, you had the wrong equation of state and the wrong pressure. The other thing that we found out is that you can reproduce the uh, measured patterns only if you uh, calculate the uh, pressures in a fluid that has a very low viscosity per particle. Now, in our field, we always talk about viscosity over entropy ratio. It's like the viscosity per particle, except that the number of gluons isn't conserved, so you can't count the particles, but the entropy counts them for you. So that was our first indication that what we were dealing with was a liquid that was quote unquote perfect, and that means flowing with nearly frictionless flow. Now this small viscosity was actually a surprise, and I wanna take a moment to talk about viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of the inability to transport momentum, the inability to sustain a wave. So the smaller the viscosity, the bigger the splash. If you can see there with a little picture of milk, if you did that with a more viscous fluid, it wouldn't splash up as high. Viscosity depends on the uh, density of particles. It depends on their mean momentum, which of course is set by the temperature of the plasma. And it depends on the mean free path. So you can see that if the density is high and the mean momentum is pretty high, the mean free path has to be very small to have a small viscosity. Mean free path being small tells you that the cross section for interaction among the particles inside the plasma is very large. And indeed, if you have a large cross section, it makes sense. It transports momentum very effectively across your fluid. Um, and we know that if you just calculate in QCD with known cross sections uh, from proton proton collisions, you don't get a very uh, large interaction cross section. You need it to be significantly larger in order to really uh, understand this uh, behavior of the quark gluon plasma. And that was our uh, indication that the quark gluon plasma has to be strongly coupled. You can actually do much better. I won't show you the very detailed comparisons with hydrodynamics, but you can calculate the higher order coefficients uh, after V2, V3, V4, careful Fourier analysis, and you find out that uh, that actually tightens up the criteria quite well that the viscosity is quite small and the system is strongly coupled. In fact, uh, the viscosity over entropy ratio is pretty near the one over four pi limit from uh, quantum mechanics. And so when you heard that the fluid at Rick was perfect, it didn't mean it was scotch, although some of us claimed that it was almost that <laughs> perfect. Um, as strongly coupled matter turns out to be pretty interesting in lots of areas of physics. In plasma physics, uh, dusty plasmas and warm dense plasmas also are strongly coupled. And in fact, uh, in dusty plasmas, such as in the rings of Saturn, you can have liquid and even crystalline phases. Uh, if there are any people who do accelerator <coughs> physics here, you know that there is an effect in uh, accelerator beams that they can clump the way that crystals would, which is due to the strong coupling among the beam particles because the density is so high. In cold atoms, um, you can heat, uh, you can cool matter down to 10 to the minus seventh kelvins and then excite a Feshbach resonance that causes a large cross section for interaction among the atoms in your trap. And then you find the same kind of elliptic flows as we see at uh, 10 to the 12th kelvins, which is really remarkable, but it's, same kind of physics. And in condensed matter, strongly correlated systems also have some interesting phases and phase transitions. And in all of these cases, you have a uh, competition going on between attractive forces and repulsive forces or the motion caused by a large kinetic energy due to high temperature. Um, so what all that competition does in each of these cases is you have many body physics and not just pairwise interactions. And that's exactly what you expect when you have strong coupling. So how small actually is this tiny viscosity in uh, quark gluon plasma? Well, usually when you think of uh, you know, the best uh, 
coldest material you think of liquid helium, and its uh, uh, viscosity per particle is sort of uh, over here at 10, where this is a measure of 4 pi times the viscosity over entropy ratio. Ultra cold atoms you can get down here. There's some very interesting measurements of that. It's a direct measurement. Quark gluon plasma is a more indirect measurement, so we have a much higher uncertainty at this point. Um, but you can see that the central value is actually even cold, even uh, closer to zero uh, viscosity per uh, over entropy than cold atoms. Now, for the viscosity to be so small, as I explained, the cross section is large, and so the, the neighboring fluid. Um, cells, the fluid elements, talk to one another. They transport information well. And that says that this fluid should be relatively opaque to quarks and gluons. Um, since I like to think in particle terms, I think of it as uh, collisions when they go through with actually clumps of stuff in the plasma rather than individual uh, quarks and gluons. And so we can check, is it really opaque as we expect? And that's uh, one of the first things we do to measure the energy transport in QCD matter. So how do you check the opacity? Well, remember I told you we make these quasi-external probes. So in this cartoon, you can see here a, a gluon from each beam coming in. Uh, once in a while, they collide with a high momentum transfer. And that sends a pair of gluons out at near 90 degrees to the beams through your quark gluon plasma. And so what you can do is measure remnants of these uh, gluons in your detector. Here is a plot of uh, neutral pions and proton-proton collisions uh, plotted as a function of the transverse momentum, so now this green line. And you can see here's a distribution. Now the beauty of this is that you can both measure it and calculate it. You can calculate it in perturbative QCD. And here you see two calculations, and they're really pretty close. The reason they're not exact, or not exactly the same either, is because this is for single pions, and that you, to go from a gluon to a single pion, you have to fragment into the hadrons that you see in your detector. And the two lines correspond to two different calculations of the fragmentation. That's why it's good to measure the, your baseline instead of only calculate it. So we can take this baseline here in proton-proton collisions and compare it to a head-on gold-gold collision. We know from geometry that this uh, nearly head-on gold-gold collision corresponds to 975 approximately nucleon-nucleon collisions. So you take this blue line, you will multiply it by your 975, and you have these blue stars. Then you do the exact same measurement of neutral pions and gold-gold collisions, and you see the red point. So you right away see that there's a big suppression. You can quantify that better by taking the ratio, the red over the blue. We call that the nuclear modification factor, or RAA. I map these points here. And you can see that from about 4 up to 20 GeV uh, transfers to the beam, 20 GeV PT, you have a suppression by nearly a factor of 5. So that plasma is really very opaque to the uh, hard scattered quarks and gluons. Lest you think that maybe we don't know what we're doing when we calculate our geometry and that 975 is suspect, this plot here, these points are the ratio of the photons that you see in gold gold over what you expect from the proton proton collisions times 975. And you can see the photons are bang on as they should be since they don't feel the strong interaction. Ah, because it's the number of, great question, it's the number of nucleon-nucleon collisions, and as these two interpenetrate each other, each nucleon uh, collides sort of eight, nine times. So this is only up to 20 GeV when uh, we turned on the Large Hadron Collider, at, well, when we turned it on with ions inside, then you can make this measurement out to 300 GeV, and you can see that even out at 300 GeV, there's a suppression by a factor of about two. So that plasma is really effective at sucking some uh, energy out of your fast-moving quarks and gluons. Here again is our control. These are photons. These are W bosons. These are Z bosons. And they're all sitting at around one. 
So it's really opaque to strongly interacting um, stuff. Now, we can do better than just measure that suppression because here's a nice cartoon of what's probably going on. Remember, the hard scattering makes you two uh, quarks and gluons or gluons that go through your plasma. So you can measure one, and then you can look 180 degrees away in azimuth at the other one. If you find this guy at high energy, probably he came off the surface, and that means the other one had to go all the way through the plasma. So here's a nice picture from the CMS collaboration that shows uh, an event where they triggered on a 205 GeV jet of particles, uh, the remnants of this quark or gluon, probably gluon. And then uh, 180 degrees away, they see this uh, much smaller, messy thing that's only got about 70 GeV. So you have really direct evidence that uh, it dumped a bunch of energy into that plasma. One of the questions, of course, is what, is, what does the plasma do with that energy? How does it transport it? Try not to do that again. Oops. No. I'm just not competent with squeezing stuff. Okay. Only with a collider. <laughs> so how do we actually learn some more about the transport of uh, this uh, lost energy inside the plasma. There, I think you have to look under the hood and ask QCD, so what's actually going on? Um, very important aspect here is how does a gluon become a jet of hadrons that you see in your detector? Well, what happens is uh, if, you have, if you're traveling in vacuum, just look at this blue triangle here, you find out that, of course, your gluon splits into a pair of gluons. They can flip into QQ bar pairs. Eventually, you get your jet of hadrons. But if you look fairly early on, you see that um, you have a first split that gives you a couple of particles, and then they split. If you bury this into inside a plasma, then you actually have interactions with the gluons in the plasma as you go along. And that interaction would cause a broadening in the PT of the particle spectra. It would cause less energy to be carried by the ones who actually make it out. And it should cause uh, more particles at lower momentum at large angle. I mean, this picture already gives you a hint that that's what we see. And in fact, you can measure that. This is a measurement looking at the ratio of the uh, number of particles in lead-lead collisions compared to that in PP collisions as a function of the distance from the, let me move back here, from the center of this jet of particles, this jet here. And what you can see is that you do, in fact, start to get some extras at the outer edges of your jet, just as you would expect from that cartoon. Some of that is uh, additional splitting from the... Uh, interaction with the plasma, and some of it is plasma particles kicked up and moved along. You can also look at the momentum of the uh, particles. Uh, again, a ratio, in this case, gold-gold divided by proton-proton collisions with uh, lower momentum going this way and higher momentum going to the left. What you see is this uh, suppression of the high-momentum particles, just as I showed you earlier, but you also see an excess of the soft stuff. So in fact, in the data, we see what we would expect from this picture, namely the medium-induced radiation and also the, uh, medium, the plasma itself, some particles uh, being kicked up by that uh, energy that you dumped into it. Another interesting question that we can address experimentally is, what about that first split? If, we, if your uh, jet has to go through a very dense, hot medium, um, it's going to interact with the uh, dense hot medium even at the time of the first gluon splitting, and we should be able to see uh, some effects of that. I'll show you how we look for that in a moment. Yes? That's a fabulous question. We don't know the answer. I think the answer is yes. Because it looks very similar to what we use to detect. Right. Right, right. Right, and furthermore, you would expect it to be coherent just from simple time arguments because it takes a while to form a hadron, and in the meanwhile, you've had more collisions if your plasma is dense enough. 
So I think that's part of the reason that uh, we see these, you know, very quick hydrodynamization. I'll come back to that. I, I, I think that's probably true. Very hard to prove yeah. experimentally, at least in a system that lasts this short. But we can, you know, look at these kinds of jet substructures. So how do you do this? Well, what you do is you calculate something called ZG. You groom away the very soft stuff at large angle. You uh, look at the first two, the, the two highest momentum clusters, and you look at the ratio of the, what fraction of the uh, momentum of the pair of these first two clusters does the second highest one take. If you have, if you do this in proton-proton collisions, you have the black points here. If you do it in lead-lead, you have the red points. These are organized, again, as a function of impact parameter. These are peripheral. These are getting more and more central, and here are the most head-on collisions. If you take the ratio to better see the difference, you can see that if the collision is fairly peripheral, there's not really any difference. But if you look over here at the most head-on collisions, you see that there is indeed a modification of this uh, ZG ratio. You are less likely to have an even split and more likely to have an asymmetric split uh, between in that first gluon splitting, and that's what you would expect from interactions with the plasma. Now, of course, uh, some of you theorists are probably wondering, how do we connect that back to QCD? Well, the way we, what we have to do is to calculate the same quantity uh, in QCD and then constrain the theory with the data. You can change the probability of interaction you can change the transport uh, within the plasma, and then you can use the agreement with data to try and uh, quantify the transport of energy and momentum in the plasma. And that work is going on now. And that, in part, also explains some of these somewhat funny-looking variables with the grooming and so on, because those are infrared safe and therefore calculable in the theory as well as measurable in the data. OK. Great, so we're starting to actually put better error bars on transport in the quark gluon plasma. Are we done yet? Well, not yet. Um, I've shown you proton-proton collisions, and in some cases we also look at proton lead or proton gold collisions as our comparison. But we should look a little bit more carefully uh, in very small systems. What actually happens there? You know, what, is, what are the dynamics in very small systems? So here I'm going back to our, uh, our V2, our second Fourier coefficient that measures this elliptic flow. And I'm plotting, this is a plot of V2 over the eccentricity, namely the deviation from spherical of that initial overlap region. And here are the uh, high multiplicity collisions. And this is plotted as a function of the multiplicity of charged particles here on this log plot. So as you go down, you see a pretty linear change. And interestingly enough, these light-colored uh, symbols are P-lead collisions. And you can see that those are exactly in line with the heavy ion collisions. Now, you might wonder, how could this be? Um, it's teeny tiny, the size of a proton. That would be a really small amount of plasma. Um, and yet, it seems to follow the same trend as the... Uh, Nucleus-nucleus collisions. So you say, uh-oh. Now you can look again differentially as a function of the transverse momentum. And here what you see is uh, proton gold and deuteron gold in these two plots. And that's an important comparison because by putting in two nucleons compared to one, you actually change the shape of the interaction region. You, make, you can make two hotspots versus one. Uh, Phoenix also did helium-3 on gold, making three hotspots. And what you see here is the uh, colored lines correspond to three different uh, hydrodynamics calculations. And you can see that they reproduce the data really quite well. So what's going on here? Somehow we still see a collective flow, even though the system is very small. You wouldn't expect this handful of particles to be enough to thermalize. And it's also seeded by that initial geometry. So that leads you to wonder, you know, how and why could 
there be a pressure buildup in such a tiny system, and that leads to exactly this coherence suspicion. No, it's a really key question of how do you get from a collection of nucleons in a nucleus to a uh, collectively flowing system? Well, that's a difficult thing to measure directly experimentally. Um, uh, as, as I've said already, uh, coherent scattering would be one way to really speed up your hydrodynamization. You have to keep in mind that you don't have to be uh, thermalized in order for hydrodynamics to be applicable, and in fact, it does seem to work. Um, there's a lot of study going on right now as to how much interaction do you need to have before hydrodynamics should work. I don't yet fully know the answer, but I think that's going to be known within the next couple of years. You know, maybe the system already has some many-body interactions. Um, maybe a nucleus is indeed very different from uh, a collection of protons and neutrons, and that those many-body interactions in the nucleus before you smack it with a proton may actually make the hydrodynamization easier to accomplish. So how are you going to find out if that's the case? Fortunately, that's something we will be able to make a measurement of. Namely, let's figure out how to look at cold, dense QCD matter. So where do you find and, and ask, is that stuff strongly coupled too? Because if it's already strongly coupled, you, you know, dump some energy in it with a uh, proton, it should look closer to hydrodynamics than we imagine. Well, if you want to look for cold, dense gluonic matter, what you need to do is to look very deep inside a nucleus. We know that every nucleon has three valence quarks. That's what we mostly think of. We know that they uh, uh, are confined by the exchange of gluons, and we know that gluons can flip into virtual quark-antiquark -quark pairs. And so what you really have going on inside a, a nucleon is this seething mass of uh, partons. And you can measure them by uh, scattering electrons off of them. You do a uh, photon transfer and kick them out. Or, you know, whatever they're going to do, you can just measure the cross-section of having a, a transfer of a particular energy photon. And from that, you can make a map of uh, the, the number of uh, quarks and gluons as a function of this variable x, which is the momentum fraction. So it's the fraction of the proton's entire momentum that any given quark or gluon valence quark, C quark, or gluon carries. You can see that you know, the valence quarks are sitting here at an X of a little bit less than a third. That's what they should be since there's three valence quarks, but you know that they're sharing some of their uh, momentum with the gluons that are exchanged. You can see that the number of C quarks increases as X decreases, as it should be, because it's a lot easier to make a soft extra particle than it is to make a higher momentum extra particle. You see the number of gluons shoots up like crazy, and it's even crazier than you might think because these are scaled down by a factor of 20. So if you can look at a nucleus in uh, you know, this X range of 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, there's a lot of gluons in there. So that's where your cold, dense gluonic matter is. Inside a nucleus, it's even denser because you are overlapping a lot of nuclei. And in fact, people have measured the ratio of uh, the uh, distribution of uh, uh, partons as a function of x in a nucleus compared to a nucleon. And you see all kinds of funny shapes here. You see an excess at uh, x near 1. That's due to the Fermi motion of nucleons inside nuclei. That you expect. You know it's not a crystal in there. Um, you see here at very small x something called shadowing. We know that the gluons interact with one another, and so they should actually uh, combine sometimes if the density is high enough. And uh, they also move, the shadowing moves some, nucleon, some gluons to a uh, um, larger value of x in this anti-shadowing region. Anyway, what we want to look at to study cold dense matter is this stuff down here. You want to go to the largest nuclei you can because this density scales as uh, the number of nucleons to the one-third, so that's an easy way to increase the density. 
hard way is to go down to smaller and smaller x. So how are we going to scatter electrons off of nuclei? Well, we're going to build an electron-ion collider. Uh, pretty soon you're going to hear the DOE uh, announce CD0, which means we're going to do this. The, we, we have an important mission to do with an electron-ion collider. And the way to build an electron-ion collider is either you can add ions to the electron facility at Jefferson Lab, or you can add electrons to the ion facility at Brookhaven. Um, there's uh, been a lot of study of the science menu, which I'm not going to bother you with today. And we know that we need to be at a square root of s of somewhere uh, around 100 and down if you want to actually map in three dimensions the uh, positions of the quarks and gluons inside nuclei. Now, the site choice, I believe, has already been made by the Department of Energy. Uh, nobody knows what it is yet, uh, but I think they're going to tell us sometime fairly soon. As far as I know, even Brookhaven and Jefferson Lab don't know what the decision is yet, but they were discussing this only a couple weeks ago, so stay tuned for that. All right, now the question is, how am I going to measure this uh, cold, dense matter at small x? Well, it turns out there's a beautiful way to do it. You uh, can measure deep inelastic <coughs> scattering off of gluons at small x. A deep inelastic scattering means that your electron coming in here, of course, I have to show a Feynman diagram in the Feynman lecture room. So here you have your uh, electron coming off, and it transfers a virtual photon to your, this is shown for a nucleon, but you can do it in nuclei as well. And so that virtual photon kicks a quark <coughs> out of your uh, nucleon. And if this nucleon happens to be sitting inside, oh, okay, you can still hear me. If it happens to be sitting inside a nucleus, then that quark has to go through the rest of the uh, gluons at small x. So I want to get at those guys. Now, this is a sort of standard picture that you see when uh, you see... Uh, when you think about electron-proton scattering, there's the electron beam coming in. This one's at like 20 jev. Proton beam at about 100 jev. And so what you would expect, of course, is that the proton beam gets only <coughs> slightly uh, deflected. So its quarks go mostly in the same direction as the proton. And the electron, having lower energy, gets smacked backwards. That's what you would naively expect. But if you want to measure here at small x, that means you're looking at quarks whose momentum is a hundredth of the momentum of the proton. And so you would actually have to turn this picture around. They, uh, it's the quark that gets smacked backwards and the electron gets only slightly deflected. You can calculate with uh, Pythia the uh, uh, X region of the gluon that gets kicked out as a function of the uh, pseudo rapidity or the uh, rapidity in the uh, lab frame um, where you see your jet. And indeed, you can see that uh, if you want to find jets from quarks at like 10 to the minus 2, you have to look at rapidities from 0, which is 90 degrees in the lab, to backwards, which is in the original electron going direction. So you have to look sort of over here. Here, you can look at what the energy of those jets is. And you can see that for uh, uh, quarks you know, that give you jets in the region here around 0 to minus 1, maybe minus 2, where the x is small, uh, your jets have an energy of, I don't know, somewhere 4 or 5 to maybe 20 GeV. So they're pretty soft jets. Can you separate them? Well, it turns out you can, and if you are patient with me while I explain this somewhat complicated figure, I hope to convince you that you can. So if you look over here, we have this kind of complicated circle plot. Um, the top is the electron going direction, and the bottom is the uh, parton going. Well, so here you can see that the electron um, started out going right down the beam pipe at some rapidity of uh, a little over 4. 
actually gets uh, moved over to a rapidity of about minus two. Again, minus is the electron going direction, uh, positive is the original proton going direction. Um, the struck parton, uh, mostly a gluon in this case, that guy has started out with a very small x. We require here an x less than 0.01. And you can see that that gets kicked back into the electron going direction. So this now is the same kind of plot. Oh, and I should also mention that the uh, circles are circles of ever increasing momentum. So here's 10 GeV, 15 GeV, 20 GeV. You can see that the electron goes from 20 GeV to somewhere between you know, 5 and 15, depending on how big the photon it kicked the quark with is. So now we have to keep the electron the same, but instead of plotting the parton, which of course you can't do in real data, we've reconstructed jets in the simulated data. And you can see that uh, we actually have a nice sample of jets that corresponds to this struck parton. And it's going in the electron direction. Um, over here, you see jets that are going at uh, very small angles with respect to the original beam in the proton direction. And those are the jets that come from the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the proton. Now, the other quarks that weren't struck, or gluons that weren't struck, and those guys go right down the beam pipe. And so they're kinematically pretty well separated. So we can go and measure these guys. And then what we can do is at, we can increase the size of the nucleus, namely increase the amount of plasma they go through, and see how much energy do they lose to this cold, dense gluonic matter. I shouldn't call it a plasma because it probably isn't. But we'll find out by doing exactly this measurement. So these jets, as I said earlier, they're about 4 to 15 GeV. They have somewhere between four and eight particles each, so that's measurable. Um, the rest of the event is really very clean. Even here in the superposition of many events, you don't see much other stuff between those jets. So we can find these jets even, they, even though they have relatively few particles. And we actually have quite a bit of practice with these low energy jets at RIC. Not too surprising since the square root of S is pretty similar. And so what we're going to do is measure the energy loss of these jets, and we'll look into the jet structure to see how are the gluons and quarks inside the jet as it uh, fragments moved around. And I think that's also how we're going to learn about how hadrons form in the first place. So I would like to then conclude. Um, I've shown you that QCD matter is strongly coupled when it's hot, and how we know that. It has a very low viscosity to entropy ratio, and it's very opaque to transiting quarks and gluons. We know that the energy uh, lost by the uh, quarks and gluons as they go through the quark-gluon plasma is transported pretty efficiently, um, and that hydrodynamics sets in really quickly, much more quickly than we ever expected. We know that the jets get broader and the particle distribution inside gets softer due to the interactions with the plasma, and that the pattern of the gluon splitting as the jet fragments into hadrons is modified. And we also found that small systems behave hydrodynamically for reasons that are still, I would say, somewhat mysterious. And I think we now know that we can experimentally get at the question of whether uh, cold QCD matter is strongly coupled to using the new electron ion collider, which I'm looking forward to. And hopefully 2029, we'll start doing experiments there. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Yeah, 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 that, that's certainly true. Now, there's uh, two reasons. Um, one of them is at the LHC, it's not cold. We know that it's pretty hot. And the hydrodynamic behavior, one explanation could very well be that you make a really tiny spot of quark gluon plasma. And so if you want to see what the uh, nucleus, uh, what the gluon density, gluons at high density that are not hot look like, 
you can't really do it very well with hadron-hadron collisions. Why do we like DIS? Well, by measuring the uh, scattered electron, we've really very nicely tagged the initial energy and direction of this quark. So if you know x and q squared to begin with and, and the energy, then you can see how the matter affects it. Now, you know, this may be crazy. Uh, nobody's actually tried doing this in nuclei quite like this before. At HERA, when they looked at um, electron-proton scattering and looked at jets, they were a lot more interested in the proton remnant. So they actually threw all that stuff away. Of course, in a proton, electron-proton, you don't have such a dense gluon system as you do in electron nucleus. A, again, a great question. So we know from the nucleus-nucleus collisions, where lots of things do look pretty thermalized, that the time scale for thermalization in a big, big dense system, it's about um, 0.6 to 1 Fermi over C. So it's, it's longer than the transition time of the two nuclei at RIC or the LHC, but it's short compared to the lifetime of the quark gluon plasma, maybe a tenth. In PP collisions, you know, all bets are off because it's such a small system, it doesn't live for very long. So um, there, there it's got to be really fast. I don't have a, you know, I don't have a good uh, feeling for what that ought to be. I mean, my intuition would say you'd never thermalize in PP collisions. Now, QCD calculations also say you don't have enough interactions. That they even can't thermalize uh, in heavy ion collisions unless they boost the, uh, the interaction cross-section among the quarks and gluons. And the, the theory worked to show how well hydrodynamics works without thermalization. That, that's still a work in progress, although there are lots of very interesting papers that uh, indicate that that's the case. I'm not ready to tell you if they're all right, though. <laughs> I had a question. Oh, yeah. okay. the, the nuclear modification factor, the, you showed the this RAA. picture where, yes, where the, there's, oh. a, there's a dip and then a flattening. Mm -hmm. what, what sets, is, is it just the strong interaction coupling constant changing its strength, or what sets the, the value of the minimum and why does it go down and up? Um, yeah, so why is there anti-shadowing? Well... But is this the same thing as the R? So this... The no, this is quite... This is in the cold matter inside a nucleus over that inside a nucleon. So it's the gluon density. Right, but in the R... PP in the RAA... RAA, yeah. Why does that go... Ah, okay, good. Okay, I understand the question. Sorry, I misunderstood well, it before. The scale for the dip, right. why does it... This one, Yes, right? yes. So... A factor of six or something. Or right, more. yeah, five for sure. So this first, you know, why does it first go down? Well, if you have um, very low PT particles, they come from the plasma at the end. So they're not really, uh, the number of those is not proportional to the number of nucleon-nucleon collisions. Those don't come from hard scattering. Those come from the number of nucleons. And so if you take the stuff up to three or four GeV PT, and you plot it, you divide it not by the number of nucleon-nucleon collisions, but by the number of nucleons, and it's nice and flat. Then once you get to sort of 5 GeV, those dominantly come from the hard scattering, and that scales as the number of nucleon-nucleon collisions. That's the sort of almost n squared instead of 2n. So that's what causes this first shape. Then over here, um, you start to have... Uh, the, the particles, the, the protons are so energetic that um, a fixed energy loss, um, you, you don't actually get as big a fraction of them dumped into the, dumped into the plasma. And, you know, this exact slope and this exact uh, height 
it's, you're folding together two things. You're folding together a steeply falling spectrum that's a power law with a, uh, a, a, a delta E, an energy loss, that's maybe fixed if it's a fixed length of plasma. And so, you know, if the spectrum changes, that exact shape changes a bit. And in fact, it is a little bit different at RIC than at the LHC because the spectrum's a bit different. So that one's, you know, you can't read the physics directly off of that. Quick question. Okay, Roy. I think, uh, uh, Roy, I ha Roy had a question. Oh, Roy, yeah. Yes. So Um, so it depends a lot on the PT of the, uh, of the quark. Um, we, we know that uh, the very high energy jets tend to hadronize primarily outside the nucleus. Of course, that quark still interacts, or quark or gluon still interacts with the gluons in the plasma, and so you get some of this extra splitting. So even those guys do broaden. But these ones down here in the sort of 10 to... 10 to 40 GeV range, those are interesting because those already start to hadronize in the, in the plasma. Um, it'll be somewhere in that same range at the EIC where they start to hadronize. Everybody says, we're going to measure hadronization at the EIC. Great. What am I supposed to actually measure in my detector? Nobody knows. So you know, everyone says, well, we'll measure the hadron spectra. But I think we can do better than that by looking at the structure of these pretty soft jets. I don't know exactly what yet, so stay tuned. This is something that I think theorists and experimentalists have to work on together. We have to do it pretty soon because we have to build the detectors that make sure that they can do the measurement, right? <laughs> so it's exciting times. All right, let's thank uh, Barbara again.